Well, good morning, and Merry Fourth Sunday of Advent, and Merry Christmas. Uh, children, you guys can go on to Children's Church, Adventurers over here and Explorers back to the back here with Mr. Steve, or towards that direction. Anyway, got uh, a number of folks traveling this week, and that's a good thing if you can do it, <clears throat> but we ought to pray before we begin. Uh, Father, we thank you for this day, and we do thank you for your mercies and your graces to us at this time of year. Uh, Father, as we look with joy at the record of the birth of your Son on this earth, we, we ask, Father, that you would fix any joy problems we have uh, with your word at this time. Father, we pray for your mercy on those who are traveling, and we pray for a good time that they would have with their family or friends. And uh, Father, I pray your blessing on, your, on our time in your word today. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. One of these weeks, I'm going to be healthy again. But as you can tell, my voice is a little bit wonky today, and uh, my back is a little bit wonky still. I'm really looking forward. I was telling somebody today, I'm really looking forward to New Year's Eve. I never celebrate New Year's Eve. I'm too tired. Uh, but I am ready for a new year this year. This has been a rough one. Yeah, so... Uh, I'm, I'm thankful, and we're trying not to do to skip over Christmas. We try really hard at El Paso Bible Church not to skip over Advent, and not to skip over. We're not going to skip over Christmas and get straight to New Year's. But this morning we're talking about joy, and that's appropriate for me because I'm having a little bit of a joy problem on occasion. Anybody else? A little bit of a joy problem? Maybe. Maybe you drive a little too much in El Paso. You have a few too many people from New Mexico turning right from the far left lane in front of you. Amen. Praise Jesus. All sorts of joy problems all over the place. You could allow that to pro cause a problem in your life. Stressed out, whatever. And uh, we're going to fix that, I hope. We'll talk about this. How God is with us. Now, and I, I, this is an important thing. We're talking about joy, and I don't know how better way to start a, a lesson that is on the theme of joy with these words. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. That's the birth of a baby. Now, some of y'all are babies, and you don't know how joyful this is. And some adults, frankly, don't have joy at the birth of a baby, and there's something wrong with them. You know what I mean? Having the birth of a baby is a joyful thing. If you're a person that doesn't have excitement and joy and rejoice at the birth of a baby. Your problems are above my pay grade. We're not going to deal with you. Go find professional help. But if you are normal and you hear so-and-so had a baby and you rejoice at that, this is a solution to your joy problem. Matthew tells the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. And this is coming on a long list of other births that have taken place that were not nearly so important, but were important as part of the process And so we have the birth of this baby, Jesus. His name is literally Savior. It was not an uncommon name, actually. There are a number of people named Jesus at this time in history. But when Matthew says this was the, the birth of Jesus Christ, it's more than that. One is a title, one is his name, and literally it just means God's chosen Savior in the form of this, this baby. And uh, there's a lot of things you can see when you see a baby. Uh, people named in Scripture, they named them with names that they would hope that they would become. Uh, they, they named them with expectation. I, I have done the same thing. Some of them have turned into some measure of irony. Uh, I won't go into what all that means in their Hebrew names, but all of their names strung together have a significant meaning that I was hoping would come true in their lives. And they're, they're teenagers, so we haven't seen how it all worked out yet. But Jesus is different, right? Jesus has been, his birth has been foretold. We have Jesus, the chosen Savior, the promised one that God had, had promised for ages past that they've been waiting for. Some of them have been waiting for so long that they, had, they really had forgotten that they were waiting or that, what they were waiting for. Some of them were under the impression, uh, you know, when you hear about uh, 
literary scholars. See, the Bible isn't the only one that has a problem with textual criticism sometimes. You hear about people that think Shakespeare is an ideal, right? Have you heard this? You, you hear about, you think that Robin Hood was like 14 guys that all embodied this certain thing. Uh, Ragnar Lothbrok, any Vikings fans out here? No, no Vikings fans? Well, you don't have to like the show, but you should like the stories of Ragnar Love. People think that he was not necessarily one person. And the people of, of Israel, some of them thought that they were waiting for this ideal. They, not, they, they had forgotten that they were waiting for the son of David. They, had, they missed that. They missed that. And so when they heard these words, they might not have understood the import of them, but we know that we can rejoice. Now, I'll be, I'll, I'll be honest with you. This has been called the man's account, right? This has been called the man's account of Jesus' birth. So if you want all the details and the who's and the where's and all that, that's somewhere else. This is Matthew. He's going to tell it like a man to men, we guess. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. You know the story. Um, Mary has found to be pregnant. Years ago, I had somebody in my office, uh, admittedly not necessarily a believer but used this phrase with me. She said, well, I believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, but I know where babies come from. So do, maybe she didn't understand what believe means. But she said, I, I believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, but I know where babies come from. And now you know what the community that Mary was born into would have said. We, we believe you, Mary, but we, we, we know where babies come from. was found to be with child. And Matthew's very clear about the situation. This was the Holy Spirit. We know that right away as we read, but the rumor mill was going to continue to produce things. And Matthew's also very, very clear about Joseph. Matthew tells us that Joseph was a just or a, a righteous man. He was a just man, Dechaos. The gracious man. He would not demand uh, that the book be thrown at Mary because that was still the law of the land. Uh, there are, by the way, it's funny to, to what, how many laws of the land are still on the books that, that we, we don't enforce or we can't enforce for whatever reason. The Mosaic law in this regard had already been developed that way that they weren't really enforcing that stoning principle. They still tried to avail themselves of it as was convenient, right? The, the woman caught in adultery, right? And we said, well, we ought to stone this lady. Let's throw her under the bus, even though we don't do this much anymore. Let's do that. But Joseph was a righteous man, according to God's standard. He did not want to disgrace her. He didn't, want to, he didn't even want shame to come on her. going to release her from the betrothal. You, you understand the betrothal, I mean, you had to get a divorce from this kind of betrothal. It wasn't like breaking a, an engagement. You, you might have a friend or a family member that's been engaged half a dozen times. It's like pouring water at the table. They just get engaged, out of engaged, engaged, out of engaged, not engaged. 
or they, they have been cohabiting for 20 years and they're still engaged somehow. Let's stop pretending, people. Let's get back into reality. But in Israel, the betrothal was more than an engagement. It was virtually everything but the consummation of the relationship. It was such that you re really required a divorce to be free of it. And in a relationship that requires a divorce, finding somebody pregnant in it is rightfully considered adultery, generally. Joseph is a righteous man. He doesn't want to disgrace her. He was going to, that's the phrase, he was going to just divorce her without a big fanfare. That was the limit to his righteousness in his own understanding. When he had considered this, an angel of the Lord. I find this phrasing interesting because frequently in Scripture when we see uh, the, the reference to the angel of the Lord, when we see that, we're, we're actually referring to the third, or the, excuse me, the second person of the Trinity, right? The, the God, the Son. And here in Matthew, where is God the Son? In Mary's uterus. <laughs> she, she's betrothed. But here we have the angel of the Lord, a messenger from the Lord. So let's not die on the hill that the angel of the Lord is always God the Son because it's not here. This is a different angel with a different name coming to Joseph. Matthew doesn't give his name here. Appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David. How many times do you think Joseph had been called the son of David in his life? Big fat hairy zero. Probably. The son of David. The, the heir of David's kingdom <laughs> would be the reference there, not the son of whoever just was the son of, physically speaking, the son of David. The, the angel is setting the bar kind of high. I need you now, Joseph, immediately. This is going to be rough on you. You need to achieve the level of David and be a man after God's own heart. Now, as a pastor, if I tell somebody, guys, you need to be you need to have God's own heart. I'm about to tell you something that is going to be difficult for you to do. I, have, I don't remember having to say this to anybody. But maybe we need to employ this a little bit more to set it as the bar. You are going to need to have God's heart in order to work through the information I'm about to give you. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. I'm not sure that, that Joseph would have identified the emotions he was feeling as being afraid. In fact, I was reading a short, it's a little short book by C.S. Lewis called A Grief Observed, and in there he says, no one told me that grief felt so much like fear. I'm not sure that we can parse out what our emotions are here, but the angel of the Lord's concern is that he not be fearful, he not be afraid of the consequences of taking Mary as his wife. Now, what consequences would he have? Well, you have to understand how the inheritance worked uh, in, in Scripture. Inheritance is very important. And in everybody's estimation, other than perhaps Mary, Joseph, Elizabeth, Zechariah, a few people, this was not Joseph's child, and yet, this person would receive the inheritance of Joseph's family. That wasn't taken too kindly. It says, your wife, the child which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. I know where babies come from. It was what everybody would say. I mean, seriously. Anybody? I, I know we're talking about Jesus here. We're reading Matthew 1, the inspired Word of God, perfect. And its original autographs, completely inerrant. But if somebody came to you and said, I'm pregnant by the Holy Spirit, you're doing it right now. I think everybody was doing it. It's not an easy truth. And then, 
Somebody comes to you and says, no, he's telling the truth. He's telling the truth. How do you know? I had a dream. It's difficult, is it not? To believe something like that, you do need to be a man after God's own heart. Son of David, you need to do this. She will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This conception, he says, this is part of God's perfect plan, son of David. You know, this angel comes to him in a dream, comes to him with this message. You know, Joseph, he just makes sawdust for a living. I know what that's like. I've done it. Literally. That's what we, we joke about. We make sawdust for a living, and sometimes furniture pops out. Smells good at, at worst, you know. He, this, is, this is radical for him to feel. It had been really quite a long time since being son of David had meant anything to anybody. And here this angel is telling him that. Go ahead and marry Mary and don't worry about your inhibitions. I need you to go beyond the just righteous thing to do. And now I need you to be gracious and full of faith. Call the son's name Jesus. You marry Mary. He call the son's name Jesus, Savior, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, you and I know, you know what we mean by that. When I say that to you, that Jesus died to save you from your sins, you know that then I will say, believe in Jesus for what? Eternal life. It's what we call justification. That, that's true. You should, the, the, the reasonable response to Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead, information is now believe in Jesus and receive eternal life. Joseph probably didn't see that exactly, that same information. What would it have meant for Israel to be saved from their sins in his day would have been, he's not seeing Roman soldiers on the corner anymore. He's not paying taxes to some pagan punk in Rome. He's not doing that anymore. Save them from the consequences of their sins. It takes on a greater meaning as we learn more in Scripture. We understand the offer to be permanent and perfect justification, simply received as a gift by faith, by grace, through faith. But I think he understood that Jesus would free them from the consequences of their sins. Nobody was under any disillusion as to why Israel was where Israel was at that time. Are you, are, y'all know enough of the history, right, that you know why Israel was not a sovereign nation at this time. That's not a wrong perception, by the way. I, I had somebody once tell me that I should denounce every single uh, prosperity preacher out there as being from the devil. And I told him, no. Because his rationale was, well, you're tell they're telling people that all you have to do is believe in Jesus and you'll be healed. And I said, well, what's wrong with that? Isn't that part of the promise? Again, this is eternal life. It's not interminable existence. It's not eternal life if it's not life like God has. And God doesn't get the flu. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't have post-nasal drip either. It's just a matter of timing, yes? Prosperity gospel teaches that you can have it now. Well, that's stupid. But they're not wrong that it's part of the promise. Perfection, health, life, like God has. Now, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. This is the passage that Bill read earlier, Isaiah 7. Just one of the verses. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Now, if you really, really want, you can go back to Isaiah 7, and you can read uh, verses 1 to 6, and then read 7 to 10, and tell me that that's talking about Jesus, and you won't be able to do it without going to Matthew 1. 
Because in Isaiah 7, Isaiah is talking about getting rid of some enemies that are laying siege to Jerusalem. And he says to Ahaz, Ahaz, I'm telling you, put God to the test. And he says, no, 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 I'm righteous. I'm not going to do that. I know not to put God to the test. And God says, you're going to get the sign anyway. (laughs) There's going to be a child named Emmanuel in this day at that time that is going to be assigned to you that God is with his people in Isaiah 7. Not God will be one day in Matthew 1, or God will be one day in the kingdom, or God will be one day in eternity, but today, Ahaz, in your time, in your day, God is with us, you, Israel. God is with us. Similar to how we use God is for us. When we say God is for us, we mean that he's on our side. I actually don't like those billboards very much. Have you seen those around? God is for you. You're on God's side, or God is on your side. I'm like, I actually don't want God to be on my side. I want to be on God's side. If we're to, if we're to clarify the nature of the statement, I, I want to be on God's side. I don't want, anyway. But that's how we use the, the present, a little bit differently. God is for us, meaning that he is encouraging us, he's lifting us up. He is our ally, and that's how you would read it back then. Uh, Solomon seems to say the same thing. In 1 Kings 8, if you read some of these verses, 1 Kings 8, 56, Solomon is speaking before a solemn assembly of the people. He just finished leading them in prayer. And he says, he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice. And I want you to know that all of the leaders in Israel doing the right thing always did it with a loud voice. That's why I do it. So there. Blessed be the Lord, who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promise, which he promised through Moses, his servant. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us. But surprisingly, that theme is not a huge one in the Old Testament. Solomon is the wisest guy that ever lived, I would say, other than Jesus Christ himself, but you know that exception. And And the most perfect perception of God's presence with them and for them is to say, I hope, I hope it'll be as good as it was in the days of Moses. I hope it'll be like that. Doesn't that sound like church a lot of times? I had this... Great experience this number of decades ago. The Lord was really blessing me so many years ago, and I hope one day that he'll bless me like that again. No, you've never heard that? Never? Come on now. The blessings of God being with us are often backwards looking, and even Solomon had this issue. I hope that God will be with my kids. It was over the golden age of Israel, the greatest time to be alive in Israel, the greatest time to be a citizen of God's chosen nation was during the reign of King David and his son Solomon, by all accounts. Perhaps not the most faithful generation, but the best time to be a part of it. And he's still looking back at Moses. I hope that it's at least that good. Well, if you talk to the people in Moses' day, what would they say about God's presence with them? It's cool and all. Fire by night. Big cloud during the day. Starving to death. Bored with manna. Can't find water. It sounded like they saw it as a great blessing. It's got to be better than that. Yeah, was God with them? Do you ever look back at Moses and say, I hope that Jesus is with me. I hope that God, with the ultimate promise of God being with me, is just like Moses. You'd be a dummy to do that. That was miserable. 
Yes, God was with them. And yes, they needed to walk by faith. Yes, they needed to keep their eyes faced forward. Yes, they needed to follow him. But God has so much more to do for us with his presence than manna, a little quail, and occasional water that tasted okay. Even Solomon looked backwards to that. Because that's what God with us meant. Either God is for us, God's our friend instead of our enemy. Uh, God is going to do good things for us. But when we get to Matthew 1, God with us means something so much more, doesn't it? He's not just our friend. He's not just our, our ally. He just doesn't have kind intentions towards us instead of evil. The angel of the Lord is telling him that God with us is God taking on flesh. What sometimes I, irre- I do, it is slightly irreverent, but you need to put on a meat suit. A body. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not exist equality with God, a thing to be grasped. But took the form of a bondservant. God with us. See, a lot of times I think we do what people did in the Old Testament, and this is dangerous. We see God merely as an an ally instead of our Savior. You know the difference between an ally and a Savior? You you probably don't even use that term, ally, anymore. But ally, somebody somebody who comes and helps you. He comes and helps you. He comes and and helps you uh, do whatever, achieve whatever in battle. He helps you to win. But Jesus says he will save his people from their sins. Does that sound like he's going to help them? Help them in their own effort, in their own victory? No. He's going to grant it to them. Rescue them. Save them. You might know that difference. But an ally supports our victory, but a Savior wins the victory for us. This was, might make some of y'all mad. I don't know. But we, you know, we often treat God with us as God being our cheerleader. You, you know? Nothing wrong with cheerleaders. I hope, we, do we have cheerleaders? I'm about to make them mad. They're important, right? They have their own problems of injuries and things like that. It's an athletic thing in its own right. But God is not our cheerleader, right? And and the difference, he's our leader. Jesus is our leader, God with us. He's not our cheerleader. He doesn't stand on the sidelines. He puts points on the board. (laughs) He wins the victory. He doesn't just encourage us to win it for ourselves. He's not our cheerleader. He's our savior and our leader. It makes a lot of difference. This is the difference between God being for us and God being with us. He's not just for us. I mean, and people point out that there is a verse, right, that says, God, if God be for us, who can be against us? That's, that's true. That's not the sum total of his ministry. He is for us because he is with us. In person, in flesh. God with us means that Jesus is our ruler, not just our role model. He's our ruler, not just our role model. What's the difference? One time I was asked in my sixth grade Sunday school class by Mr. Greg Curtis, a faithful man, to give an example of a hero. hero. There were about three other sixth grade boys in the comic book uh, excuse me, in that class, and they came up with comic book answers. What's a hero? Batman. Actually, Batman's kind of a quasi-hero, isn't he? He's got no special powers. He's just got a lot of money and some gadgets. Batman, Superman, whatever. I remember him asking that. They're heroes. They're role models. Does a role model have to know who you are? For you to be a role model. People talk about all all sorts of people as being their role models. A lot of times they have no idea that they're role models. 
They have no idea that you're trying to be like them or to do what they do or to emulate their values. They have no idea that they're doing that. And they have no interest. And they would expect you to deviate from their example, right? If you go to somebody and say, I'm following this person's example, are you following? Are you doing exactly what he's doing? No, my personality comes through, my strengths, my, I'm going to be the best me that I can be, but I'm, I'm following this role model. Is that an option for a ruler? No. He's not a role model. He's our ruler. He knows each of us by name. He knows what we can do, <laughs> what we can't do, what we should do, what we shouldn't do, what's within our capacity. And when he tells us to do something, it's not because it's some grand general principle, it's because it's the best thing for us to do. Because he loves us, knows us, and is seeking our best interest. He's God with us, not just God for us. He knows the potential that we have. That's important. I think the men in the room might understand me. I don't know. Women probably under, think about these things too. I'm not trying to be... You know, people can't spell the word misogynistic, but they'll cast that dispersion on anybody these days. The bigger problem we have is actually misandry in our culture. But you don't hear about that. Uh, rather than hatred of women, we have hatred of men. If you dare to have a a Y chromosome, all of a sudden you're toxic. I don't mean it that way, but it helps me a lot to know that God is with us in Jesus Christ. He is with us and not just for us. Because I can know that as long as I am breathing, as long as I am here, subjected to his will and doing his work in this life, acknowledging he's my ruler, not just my role model, that he is not just my ally, but he is my savior. That he is my leader, not just my cheerleader. That I have more to do. And that I have not peaked. Because his work has not peaked. Now, that may not be the most warm, fuzzy thing that you've ever heard the Sunday before Christmas. That's okay. I'm not feeling, oh, my throat is feeling a little fuzzy, but I'm not feeling terribly warm and fuzzy today. But every single day, we say this truth that Jesus is God with us and not just God for us is a reason to get up and do what he says to do every single day. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. We do thank you for your word. We thank you that despite all of the things, that God being with people throughout all of the ages meant that it means more than that in your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the grace that came by him so that we would have life and life in him, an abundant life. In your son's name we pray, amen.